Uh, my name is Tim Lorden. I am the executive director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy. This is our first in-person like event um, since before the pandemic, so we're really excited to be back, and it's been challenging to figure out how to get, do everything again. So thanks for bearing with me. Um, this is, uh, now it's last slide, I guess we recess, so we're, at we're officially in August recess, so congratulations. Um, this event is hosted in conjunction with the Congressional Internet Caucus itself, which um, the co-chairs of which in the House side are Congressman Michael McCall and Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, and on the Senate side, it's Senator John Thune. So, you can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay, I'm going to have to speak very loudly. I apologize. Um, so the Congressional Internet Caucus has been doing in-person briefings in the Rayburn Building and Longworth and elsewhere um, since 1996. So this has been done a very long time. And during that period of time, I wasn't with the caucus back in uh, 1996, but I've never seen an issue with such velocity as artificial intelligence policy. And we go back a long way, whether it be net neutrality, copyright, privacy, you name it. Um, the last seven months when it comes to regulatory policy, when it comes to artificial intelligence, is nothing short of astounding um, with the velocity and the number of people who are calling for some type of regulation one way or another. Um, that's extremely unusual. So this is a really an interesting moment. We thought that the last seven months being so dizzying that we get a group of experts from a variety of different perspectives to come and talk about, to give a recap of the last seven months, um, because after August recess, it's going to be crazy again leading into the holidays. So we wanted to just do a quick recap, a roundup, where we are, who's doing what, um, and then they can offer uh, their perspectives. Um, I, I would say that you know artificial intelligence isn't really kind of new, but it kind of flat, it kind of manifested itself in the last um, eight months in a way that I don't think people were ready for. Um, the, the, the Congressional Internet Caucus was created in 1996. Um, that year, um, IBM's Deep Blue supercomputer played Gary Kasparov in a, in a game of chess and lost. Uh, the following year, um, Deep Blue beat uh, the Grandmaster uh, Gary Kasparov in chess. Um, and that was at the dawn of the Congressional Internet Caucus. And that's been a long time, but the last seven months have been really dizzying. So we put together a great uh, panel of speakers we have um, Nick Garcia with Public Knowledge, um, which is a public interest group here in the city. We have Anna Linhart, who is with the Institute for Data and Democracy and Politics at George Washington University. Uh, she's also a former congressional staffer, so she knows what you guys are all dealing with. Um, we also have uh, Joshua Landau, who's the senior counsel for the Communi Computer and Communications Industry Association, CCIA, which is probably like the, lo the longest running, oldest, technology trade association that I know of in the city. Um, and then, of course, there's um, uh, A.V. Uh, Philly, uh, Global Policy Director for Credo AI, which is a great um, artificial intelligence company. So let me just start off. I think, I think one of the um, misperceptions is that um, no, no, Congress doesn't do anything. So what we want to do is kind of like have, have our panelists talk about what's been happening, who's doing what, and then maybe have them share some perspectives. And we also want to get questions from you guys, the audience. Um, and we'll, fin we'll finish up that. We'll do a really quick one hour um, so you can get on with your recess. But I think there's a misperception that um, uh, when I hear people from outside of Washington talking about Congress, there's a lot of cynicism about Congress can't get anything done, and that's a, that's a common trope and a common refrain you hear. Um, but I think Anna has a really good uh, perspective on what Congress is doing and a good roundup, just a quick roundup on what's going on with Congress when it comes to artificial intelligence, whether it be bills sponsored, bills, you know, bills be, amendments being tucked into defense, uh, defense authorization bills, whether it be like new type of round table discussions in the Senate. Can you give us kind of a uh, uh, roundup on that? Yeah, happy to. And I actually, can you hear me? Do I need to press this button too? Okay. Um, so I think it's actually helpful to start with a little bit of a rewind to the 117th Congress. So Tim described the last seven months as dizzying, but for those of us paying attention to tech policy last Congress, which was admittedly less than uh, the whole public is now, um, but it was an incredibly historic Congress for tech policy in the sense that we had historic breakthroughs on comprehensive bipartisan privacy legislation in the House. We had bicameral efforts to regulate competition in the digital markets. And we also had a few new bills uh, that were the first of their kind regarding transparency, both transparency of the social media and information environment, so bills like PADA, the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act, bills like the Digital Services Oversight and Safety Act, and then also the Algorithmic Accountability Act, which was actually a, a second time reintro, 
but was incredibly flushed out with a lot of research from the AI transparency space and really goes after high-risk critical decisions. So it was a historic Congress in the sense that really great text was, was written. Now it needs to be updated, needs some work, and needs, certainly needs attention, but it's actually a great starting point for thinking about the harms and risks of generative AI and, and all data processing broadly. So fast forward, forward to February, March. As Tim mentioned, there was a bit of a narrative that started to emerge around Congress hasn't done anything, hasn't even put proposals forward, um, is starting from scratch. Um, and I just really want to make sure everyone in this room knows that that's not quite true. Your bosses, your bosses' colleagues have certainly been thinking about some of these risks, data protection, uh, harms to the information ecosystem from the proliferation of fake or misleading content, uh, harms related to competition in the digital markets and just high concentration of power there. So for near-term risks, Congress is ready to act and I believe has a lot of text to work with. The definitions need to be looked at, they need to be marked up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when we start to think about some of the further kind of in the future where we want to go with generative AI, this is where I think we're seeing some new work this Congress. So there's been a lot of proposals for task forces, commissions, councils. Um, you know, in the 116th Congress, there were a lot of privacy bills. It was almost like every member wanted their own privacy bill. I think we're now in the everyone wants their own generative AI or AI task force bill. And you know, I have mixed feelings on this sort of trend. I think to the extent it builds interagency capacity, I think that's great. Um, one thing that is unique about AI compared to other innovative technologies that Congress has regulated in the past is that it does span all sectors. So we do need people at Department of Labor, Department of Transportation, at HUD, all paying attention and working on this. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent we're building structures for that, I think that's great. Some of my concern looking at that language is that some of it does seem to be a little bit of a repeat of what's already happened, especially the work that's been done at NIST already and is continuing to be done there. NTIA already is doing a pretty big comprehensive review of AI tools. They have 1,200 comments they just received that they're working on and looking at reports. So I think it's really important to not ask underfunded, understaffed agencies to redo work they've already done. And I think it's really important we don't use those councils and task forces as an excuse to not to sit around and wait until a report comes out to tell Congress what to do when they already know they need to go after bias and discrimination in algorithms, privacy protections, concentration in the cloud market. We already know some of the things we need to do here um, to the extent we need to think about new things like drawing bright lines, licensing, limits. I think that's a space where these councils could be useful. So, um, so Congress has directed um, with different bills um, the executive branch to do certain things. Um, the executive branch is already starting on their own initiative to do a few things. Um, the, just a few weeks ago, the White House got together with like seven AI companies and had a voluntary code of conduct. Uh, some of Josh's members um, were part of that agreement. Josh, can you just give us a rundown of like what's been what's happening at the executive level? Um, and you don't have to like go over every agency, but obviously the, the voluntary code of conduct. What is OSCP doing? What is NTI doing? I will notice that um, this two pager by Hermine Wong. Um, it's the top 10 federal regulators of AI you should know, you should know, and this is what they think. And it lists all the different uh, federal agencies that are working on AI policy and what they're doing. So I, I'm going to try to tweet this out afterwards. But um, Josh, can you give us like a quick rundown? Yeah, so I think, the, um, I don't know if that helps to hear me. Um, I think the, the, obviously the AI commitments from a few weeks ago show that the White House, the executive agent, the executive office itself is quite involved in this. And it's something that the industry itself is also engaged in, that they are trying to do self-regulatory things. They recognize there are these risks and want to solve them. Beyond that, we've got OSTP. NIST has been hugely influential with the risk management framework as to how to address a lot of the AI. It, I can, yeah, I guess that is better. Um, maybe these are just very, very weak microphones. Um, so NIST has been very active with their risk management framework, and that has been, I think, very influential in AI policy across the government as an approach to managing AI risk, saying we don't need to prescribe particular ways of doing things. What we need to do is look at the outcomes and avoid uh, the risk of bad outcomes. This is similar to 
the regulatory process in nuclear power, for example, where they don't say you must do X, Y, and Z. They say you must reduce the risk that this will happen below a certain point. So I think that that's another good example of where the executive branch is focusing its efforts. It's not saying apply this particular approach. It's saying here are the outcomes we want to see you achieve. Minimize risk that they won't be achieved. Minimize risk that something bad will happen. Um, beyond that, NTIA, OSTP have both been heavily involved in uh, my own area of expertise in patent law, the USPTO, the Copyright Office, have both been heavily involved to ask how will AI affect our particular issues. And I don't know in, uh, this was something that you said, you know, labor, HUD, all of the other departments are going to be in, impacted by AI. I don't know for a fact that they're looking at it, but I would assume that they are looking internally even if they haven't gone through a, a public comment process. Yeah, in, in some agencies also with particular expertise like CFPB, EEOC, um, SEC, like everybody, it's like an alphabet soup of people jumping into the AI space. Can you just give, quickly give a rundown, like just real, what are the what are the elements of the code of voluntary code of conduct? Just real quick. Yeah, so I think. I put um, you on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. I just pulled it up in uh, in case of just this question. Um, I think one thing to bear in mind with the AI code of conduct, and this is true in general, is that the AI code of conduct that the AI commitments are specifically about generative AI not about AI as a whole, and that's good. We want to treat different forms of AI differently because they work very differently, and they're going to have very different impacts on uh, the US. But the, the core is sort of trust, safety, and security, so making sure that the output of AI is trustworthy, is not biased, is not discriminatory, making sure that the data that goes in and the data that comes out are properly secured, sort of the general cybersecurity issues, and safety, making sure that a product isn't going to cause harm to the public. And I think these are sort of general commitments and it's more figuring out how do we achieve these. There's some more specific commitments. I highly encourage reading the actual uh, document. Um, there's a lot in there. But one of the big sort of options is let's have people both internally and externally try to attack our own AIs to see what our vulnerabilities are to prove it. This is called red teaming. It's incredibly common in computer security generally. And it's something that is already going on. It's something that is encouraged by this to make sure that you understand what your risks are, what your exposures are, and so that you can fix them before somebody malicious goes and attacks them. So thanks, thanks, Josh. Um, the past, I'd say the past 10 years, um, this has been particularly true, but it's always been true since I started working on internet policy issues in Congress in the 1997, 1998, is that one of the big drivers of some of the policy initiatives that we take on in the United States is regulation overseas. Um, and the European Union has been particularly active in the in t internet policy space in the past 10 years. Again, the, you can go back to the data directive of 1998, 1996. Um, they've always been very active, but um, they are all they have been really driving a lot of different internet policy issues. And EV has a particular perspective. Um, and uh, can you give us a roundup of what's going on across the pond? Yeah. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. I'm naturally very soft-spoken, so I'll try to be very close to the mic. Um, so, AV Philly, I'm Global Policy Director at Credo AI, and we're a responsible AI governance platform in the private sector. So, we're a tool provider, uh, we have a SaaS platform, and we're trying to help companies adopt responsible AI at scale. Um, so, our interest in the EU AI Act is very much um, how we can interpret that and utilize it for all of our, our customers and companies, uh, which are global. And I would say we support it very much so. It's, it's a process that's been going on for a number of years, starting with the high-level expert group in 2018. The regulation itself was proposed in April of 2021. So this has been a, a long and well-thought-out process um, on behalf of the European Union. And I think that we often hear um, critiques of AI regulation. And I would, I would make the point that I think it is, is something that has held us back from developing re AI responsibly, is this um, desire for perfect policy. And I think that what we should be aiming more towards is um, 
trying something and, and really attempting to bring greater transparency to the process because the risks and harms are happening every day and they're very real. So we need some methods and mechanisms by which we can try to address them. So I think that the EU AI Act um, does that. Uh, it's, it's a risk-based contextual regulation. Uh, it's very comprehensive in scope and it's essentially uh, two documents. The first is the proposal for the regulation. That's regulation with a capital R, which in the European Union means that it's automatically applied in all of the EU member states. So it's not a directive that will be interpreted at the member state level. Um, it, it's going to be very binding at, as soon as it's passed. So that's important to note. And the second document that's a part of uh, this regulation is a series of annexes that include examples and uh, elaborations as to what is comprised in the regulation proposal itself. Um, there's four levels of risk in the EU AI Act. Uh, so unacceptable, high risk, uh, limited risk, and minimal or no risk. Now, of course, um, this entire categorization it changes slightly with the European Parliament's um, amendments. So they have 144 pages of amendments that they have proposed as part of the process that the European Union goes through, the regular legislative process to um, determine the European Parliament's position, the Council's posi position, and the Commission's position. And all of these have to be aligned before the regulation is finalized. So with the Parliament's changes, they've taken in into consideration generative AI and foundation models. So this is a big change. Um, as of <laughs> April 2021, the regulation that was proposed didn't address uh, generative AI in the same way that the Parliament's uh, proposals uh, to change it do. So where we're at now is um, the process called the trialogues. So trying to uh, unify a position for the European Union between the Parliament, the Commission, and the Council. Um, and they just concluded, I believe, the first uh, week of trialogue negotiations, I think last week, where they went through one third of, of the articles already. Um, and this process is shepherded by the Spanish Council presidency. Um, so the presidency rotates in the European Union. Currently, um, Spain holds the presidency. And the intention is to fi finish the negotiations by December December of this year. So all that to, to lay the groundwork for where we're at with the EU AI Act, but I think um, we can dive deeper into some of the articles. Obviously, um, we would be excited to answer questions on Article 11 or Annex 4, or Article 28B, so excited to get into it. Thanks, Avi. Um, and Nick, with regard to you know, your perspective and public knowledge's perspective, um, maybe we could do a, start a conversation about what what are kind of the baskets of types of regulation and legislation and, 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 and oversight are we going to see with regard to some of these bills or the actions in different agencies or, or you know, what Evie just laid out with regard to the European Union. There's all sorts of different types of proposals from regulatory sandboxing, uh, protecting sensitive data sets, um, you know, creating a, maybe a new agency that's been floated out there that we need a new agency to look over these things. And by the way, that's been, that's been floated for privacy and with competition policy. That, that happens a lot. But um, there's certainly that's out there with a few bills. Um, more transparency, maybe do a, like a, the, NIST, the NIST favorite, which is risk assessment um, sure. type. What, what approaches do you think um, are out there and what ones do you think work? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question and, and a good starter to go in on because you have to think about what kind of approach you want and what is going to give us the durability and flexibility to continue to respond to this. So I think a lot of folks felt taken off guard by how quickly this has happened and how quickly it seems to be changing, even on a daily or, or uh, hourly basis sometimes. Uh, you're, you're getting new news about new developments in AI, about new approaches to doing regulation, and trying to keep up with this can seem extremely challenging. So to break down some of these approaches that we've seen over the last year, um, one thing that we've seen is people calling for a pause on research or outright bans or things like this. Um, something that, like that might make sense in the context of um, what the EU AI Act would call like these extremely high risk or, or un, um, unacceptable risk use cases, like uh, maybe keeping something like keeping artificial intelligence decision making out of control of nuclear weapons or something like that. Um, but generally when it comes to trying to do a research pause or a ban, um, I, I definitely take the perspective that this genie is out of the bottle to some extent on that and that's not really a realistic path forward even if we would love to get back uh, six months or a year or two years of our time. Um, so the best time to start acting is, is now, frankly, on figuring out what the regulatory regime is going to look like. Um, Another approach we might call would be like a voluntary industry-based approach. I think we're seeing that this is already happening with the AI commitments. Um, 
ahead of the EU AI Act, um, companies in Europe are starting to agree to kind of like an AI pact to implement some elements of the uh, EU AI Act on a voluntary basis. Uh, again, this is a great kind of a stopgap measure, certainly, um, to know that, especially amongst the biggest players in the industry, that there's going to be some standards um, that they're going to be coordinating with each other. Um, we just recently, this week, uh, heard about the Frontier Model Forum, which is going to be a, a coordinating industry group for very large models on, on the frontier of AI technology. And that's going to be a valuable venue for policymakers and decision makers and industry to coordinate on what the best practices are to ensure that we have safe um, and trustworthy technology. But all of these things are going to fall down a little bit if we don't have real accountability and regulatory measures to back up these kinds of commitments and frameworks. I think we've seen that historically with how things have gone with social media and tech in the past. Um, a lot of the uh, proposals that Anna was talking about in the initial roundup are things that are initially proposed in response to the fact that it's taken us a long time to come to grips with some of the real harms and difficulties with social media technologies. And now we're finally getting to the point we're thinking about doing that and there's a new technology coming along down the pike that seems to be very, very deeply related and is going to raise a lot of the same concerns. So I think uh, certainly that voluntary industry driven kind of approach is a great measure for right now, but we definitely have to think about what the accountable regulatory version of that looks like. AB? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a great point, Nick, but I think I would um, actually disagree a little bit that I think the commitments will fall down a lot, not a little bit, <laughs> if they are voluntary. I think we have seen that the voluntary commitments haven't produced the results that we would like to see over the past few years. And as Anna said, uh, you know, there are real risks and harms privacy, algorithmic accountability, fairness, bias, all of these can be addressed with greater transparency reporting and disclosures. And there is significant research in this space as to how to do that transparency reporting. But I think without mandating that companies need to have a certain level of transparency around what their model is, how they have trained the model, what the data is that was used, <clears throat> how it has changed over time, expected um, implications of the model, unintended consequences, all of these are things that are not necessarily proprietary information or intellectual property that companies cannot release, and it should be mandated, because without mandating that this level of transparency was required from any company using AI, frankly, they shouldn't be using AI on the market. And it, it is very possible, and I, I just think that the voluntary aspect is holding us back. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, I answer? Sure. Oh, go ahead and respond. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, in total agreement, uh, perhaps I was just being a little bit more diplomatic than I needed to. Uh, but uh, when it comes to like, the how to back that up from a regulatory perspective, one thing that we've said is that it's definitely transparency, it's definitely accountability, it's definitely the regulation, but it's also absolutely thinking about privacy in a really robust way, mm -hmm. getting the competition policy element of it involved as well. It's why so many of the bills that were introduced in the 117th Congress are going to be important because they are multi-purpose in that way and that they are going to apply to the technologies um, that we've already been dealing with for 20 years in the form of the online platforms, and many of those same things are going to apply to artificial intelligence going forward. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be like an all of the above approach is what's really necessary, and, and that kind of decisive action to have real regulation is going to be important. Yeah, and I just want to add and add some clarity here because I think it's helpful. So, the bills written in the 117th Congress and the ones being reintroduced and talked about now as well, if you look at the definition of covered entity, online platform, covered platform, they all use their own spice on that. It would include, for the most part, many generative AI tools, and maybe Nick can go into how open source complicates some of that, but by and large, many of the generative AI tools we're talking about get covered in those definitions. And I have a whole white paper that dives into that a little bit and where there might be some ambiguities, and I'm always happy to be a resource to people on that. But I think it's really important just to mention that they're already covered there. And then the other thing I think is important to mention is I think it's easy, especially for members of Congress that are new to tech policy, to sort of conflate social media harms and generative AI harms, and they are related. Um, you know, when we think about a generative AI tool, we have a lot of questions and when we think about transparency, we're thinking about some very specific things. How is this model trained? What's in that training data? How is it being red teamed? What is it being red teamed for? What are those processes like? Um, the content that's generated, how do we know it was generated by that tool? Is it watermarked? Is it labeled in some way? 
Those are really important questions for producers of generative AI tools. But that does not solve one of the really big harms I think members of Congress are concerned about and have been thinking about for a long time, which is what is the proliferation of untrue or just misleading or, you know, content that could be dangerous at a mass scale mean when it's introduced to the information environment. And that's where a lot of the policies around transparency of social media companies still are very relevant in this conversation. I want to know how Google and Facebook and TikTok are planning to handle this content once it's on their platform. So those policies are still incredibly important to many of your members, I, I assume. So it is helpful to yeah. think about the whole pipeline. So one thing that, one point I really want to make is that we shouldn't actually care about whether it's an AI doing this or a human. We don't care whether an AI is doing housing discrimination or a human. It's bad. We shouldn't do it either way. A lot of the AI risks are actually already being addressed by the existing laws, existing copyright law, existing discrimination law. All of those apply in the AI context. We had the uh, Lena Khan letter, uh, I want to say a few weeks ago, because it feels like a few weeks ago, but I think further than that at this point saying, you know, we have these authorities and we will apply them and that's a good thing. And I want to caution against being too AI specific. Where there's a harm, don't write it as if an AI does this, it's bad. Just say this is a harm, it is illegal in this way. Whether an AI does it, whether a human does it, there are going to be questions about, you know, if an AI is doing it, an AI system is operating and a human employs it in a particular way, where does the liability lie? Those are sorts of questions that maybe this specific regulatory need for the transparency questions, those are questions where a specific regulatory approach might be very helpful in making sure that the information that's necessary to enforce is there. But if you write regulation that targets AI specifically on a harm that is also targeted by existing law or that is targeted differently by a new regulation, some privacy harm where if a human does it, it's one thing, if it's AI, it's another thing, you're opening up regulatory arbitrage issues where you've actually created a financial incentive to do it with AI or with a human, and that will affect how people behave, it will affect where research and development goes. So thinking more broadly, and these are harms that AI is surfacing, but they're not really harms of AI. They are harms in general. Um, I think, I think um, you know, you, you, Anna met, brought up the idea that, you know, the social media, there'll be a lot of content generated on social media. Um, I also note that, I guess it was last week or two weeks ago, the Federal Communications Commission, which, uh, when I started in internet policy, was the main regulator for communication technology, <laughs> um, uh, that they held a hearing on what happens when AI-generated content starts actually robocalling people and trying to, you know, defraud them on, so there's a whole, the velocity and the creativity of content generation, whether, whether it be over your phone network, for your, your mother or grandmother, um, or whether it's on social media and the things that we've been dealing with for the past, you know, maybe seven or eight years with regard to misinformation and things like that. Um, I guess the question is, like, how, how are these companies going to deal with, you know, we, we search engine op optimization has been a problem for a long time, right? You know, sometimes you'll click on a link um, that's, you know, look, it looks okay, but then you get there, you realize it's just, you know, just crap, right? It's not, it's misinformation, it's not really true, or it's just no good. Sometimes, now more and more people are seeing their feeds being generated with, you can tell it's kind of uh, um, generative AI type, type content. And what's, what happens when uh, across a variety of different types of content, we're being flooded with the velocity and the sheer magnitude that these tools can generate? How do we deal with that? Because we haven't dealt with it very well um, in, the, in the last go around with social media? I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, it's a lot of the same, you know, looking to a lot of the same solutions. And I, I definitely am not someone who thinks there's going to be one bill to solve everything you just discussed. I think it's going to include education, how we're teaching young people to interact with the information. I think it's going to be so multifaceted. But I think for me, the starting point has, has always and continues to be transparency. We really need to know how recommender systems on a lot of these platforms work. We need to know how ads are targeted on these platforms. Uh, that also directly ties into how is personal information being used? How is this kind of deep trove of data that these companies have on every consumer being used to continue to target them? And, and with the proliferation of, you know, sort of this generated content, I get even more nervous because it could really just hide in these sort of predicted groups of people that will engage with it. So that's where the privacy reform is really helpful. And then competition. I think the more platforms we have making these types of decisions about 
what should be done with content created through generative AI tools. I think you'll be able to do comparison. Advertisers will have choices. Consumers will have choices. And you'll see a little bit more there. So it's going to take a lot. Um, Ryan Kahlo is a professor from University of Washington. And he had kind of said recently that um, a lot of these conversations from you know, luminaries in the, in the technology space about um, AI's uh, existential threat to humanity um, are really just like a smokescreen and a diversion from actually dealing with the issues that Congress should be dealing with anyway, right? So that's to key off what you just said, Anna. Um, I like I, I'm just parroting what um, uh, Ryan Kahlo had said. Um, do you feel like um, Congress knows that, uh, do you think that they're leapfrogging to a new policy space and forgetting about dealing with the old issues? Or do you think it's a holistic approach? Let's look at all of our existing problems, whether it be misinformation, competition, uh, big data, yeah. in the context of AI. Can, yeah. I, can I get your, all, all your perspectives on that? Yeah, I'm curious what other people think. But I, I could just quickly say from looking at the bills in the last seven months, these bills being introduced outside of the Commerce Committee do seem to be sort of almost erasing the work that's been done in the Commerce Committee. So I am a little bit nervous about that happening. But I'm hopeful that there is expertise in the Commerce Committee that's been there and can continue to be there. And that more members, I think what I'm excited about is more members are wanting to engage. And so I'm hoping they can get uh, collaborative. Yeah, I mean, I think back to your earlier point, Tim, uh, a lot of lessons uh, can be learned from the content moderation space. And, and a few of those are being taken forward. I think it'd be interesting to see more um, about how you know uh, government private sector collaboration has worked on content moderation. What are the lessons learned with some of these bigger tech companies? Um, how are they sharing information that can inform best practices, that can inform standards? Because truly, what we need a lot more of in this space are, are standards. But I think <clears throat> coming back to you know, are we leapfrogging? I think they're all interconnected. You know, privacy, cybersecurity, obviously the foundation building blocks of AI. So we do need legislation in, in those spaces as well that, that is smart um, and, and up to date. But I think um, really coming back to Josh's earlier point on the AI commitments last week from the large language model providers, those seven companies, I mean, they're specific to generative AI, as you noted. And I think that that has become um, very much a buzzword of where we're focused now in the policy space. But we should be examining the entire AI stack. So not only looking at providers and, and the large language model providers and what they could voluntarily commit to, but also how what is their relationship with developers, downstream developers and companies using their APIs? Uh, how are those companies um, expected to be transparent? What should they know about the model that they're using? What do they, what information do they need to provide um, publicly or to the US government so that they are also being transparent? So I would say not as concerned with the leapfrog is issue so much as the consolidation of the focus onto just a few of these um, large language model providers where we should be looking at requirements throughout the entire stack. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, Nick, Josh, um, are we, is Congress kind of chi chasing the shiny new object, which is said a lot, right? Whether it be AI is the shiny new object or generative AI specifically is the shiny new object and not dealing with the, the age old issues. Yeah, so um, I want to view it as an opportunity, right? There's a lot of now new energy and excitement and frankly some anxiety about this technology which is driving a lot of people to be engaged in tech policy. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, it presents an opportunity to do the kinds of things that we should have done a while ago in regards to some of these old technologies and in, and in regards to um, old business models that we know are around and know are problematic. Um, and it also gives us the opportunity to address the new and shiny problems. Uh, I think specifically responding to some of the concerns about people getting distracted by things like existential risk or AI safety questions. Um, that has to be a matter of us knowing how to walk and chew gum at the same time in terms of being able to make policy about things that are prospective and in the future and also address the real harms that we know are already happening or are going to be happening very imminently in the future. Um, and so we need to be able to do both of those things at the same time, have those discussions um, about what the future looks like um, while addressing the current stuff. And as Anna was alluding to, there's a lot of people that have put a lot of thought and work 
into how to address some of these problems that we already know exist, like discrimination and bias for people on the civil rights side and the algorithmic accountability movement. Um, we have privacy advocates that have been working for a long time to address how uh, our relationship with data and with big tech companies can be addressed through comprehensive privacy reform. Um, and we have competition policy advocates who've been for a long time talking about how we need to have a better, more comprehensive competition policy uh, approach to technology so that we can have the kinds of things like choices for users and transparency for users to be able to go to the platforms and use the technologies that they feel are going to respect them. So I hope it's something where we have this opportunity right now where this is all very exciting and new and maybe even a little scary to take advantage of that energy to really get down to work and do all of the really important stuff that needs to be done at once. I don't have much to add after that very comprehensive set of answers, <laughs> but I, I do hope that we're skipping past the very overblown existential risk. Uh, if we want to talk about existential risks, I think there are more imminent ones than AI. And I hope that, and it does seem like people are, maybe they're using that as a reason to focus on it, but that's not the focus of where people's interest in regulation lies. They are looking at the much more imminent harms and looking at how do we address those, which is good. I'm hopeful that that continues. Um, ideally, what we would have done is had like an hour briefing before this briefing and gone over the different types of artificial intelligence. Uh, Evie kind of started um, laying that out a bit. There's more than just LLMs and generative AI. Um, and we also would have gone into like where, what, what corpus of um, internet information does these large language models feed off of and digest. And we would go with, we would basically spend an hour just laying it all out, but we didn't have time. And I don't know if you guys want to sit around for another hour while we do that. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, I think my, my last question before I go to the audience for questions, we also, there are so many different flavors of, of of artificial intelligence policy here. We could, have got, we could have done something entirely on copyright, which we probably will do after the August recess. We might have an entire thing on copyright. Um, and we probably would have different panelists on that, because copyright is its own discipline, right? Um, and so it raises some interesting questions. So we'll probably do that after the recess, um, the next time we do this. Um, but you know, I think I'd ask you guys just to talk a little bit about just copyright, just off the top of your head, just issue spotting. Uh, like. <laughs> For, to prepare us for the next briefing on this. So I will just quickly jump in and say, we wrote a white paper and released it. It has a very brief but very readable description of the different types of AI. So, you know, highly recommend CCIA's AI white paper. Um, on copyright, honestly, I think that a lot of the issues in copyright are going to be handled by existing copyright law. We know how to analyze if the output of an AI is infringing. We have fair use on text and data mining. These are not new questions. These aren't even new answers in a lot of cases. It just is going to require a single court case saying, yeah, we apply copyright law the same way to AI as we've applied it to other new technologies. And the other thing I would think about, and I've been thinking about this a lot recently, is uh, back when computers became a big thing, we had the Committee on New Technological Uses in Copyright that looked at how do we address copyright and computer software before we knew that computer software was going to be considered a, cop a subject of copyright. It wound up producing a record and then a recommendation to Congress. And I know we've had some discussion about we don't want to wait on the committees. But in circumstances where we think the existing law probably does cover things, that may be a good approach to say what additional things might we need in this area. As we see, you know, it's been seven months. That's barely time to get to a first hearing in a lawsuit. We don't know how the courts are going to treat it yet. We have some good guesses, I think, based on existing precedent. but. We don't know for sure if there even is a problem there with copyright specifically. And until we know, it's uh, maybe a little premature to go and completely rewrite our copyright law just based on AI. Uh, dangerous to turn it over to me, Tim. I could easily do the full hour on copyright if you let me. No, but I, no, I'm going to no, try to please. do it very fast. Um, so uh, I think we tend to break this down into two categories in terms of when we try to approach the copyright questions. We want to think about inputs and outputs into the system um, and how the questions break down on this either side of that line because it is important to recognize that in machine learning systems something very significant is happening in, in the system. This is not um, a collage machine or something like that as it's sometimes been made out to be. It's, it is different from that. So on the input sides, um, when we're talking about the training data and the process of training itself, um, 
I strongly agree uh, that um, this is solvable by current copyright law. We, we know that there are very good reasons that web crawling and web scraping should be protected fair use. This is an essential component of the open internet. Um, and simple access to works does not um, infringe on the copyright of that work. Um, so the same goes for the training process there, that um, I think it's very clear under current copyright law that the process of using the data, even if it's copyrighted content, um, probably doesn't really impinge on copyright on any specific of the bundle of rights within copyright itself. Um, but even if you wanted to make an argument that it did, it's probably a fair use. Um, and I think that does sort the input side. On the output side, I would say the copyrightability and the extent to which human contribution to a work is necessary in order to get copyright <coughs> is just a really tough question to administer, but we have the basic principles of um, how much human creativity should have to go into something in order for there to be originality and authorship and therefore copyright. Um, the other output question is in terms of infringement. Um, and I think that we see things like overfit um, as a good example of how existing copyright law would look at a very overfit output and say we can make an assessment about substantial similarity here to determine if there is some infringement happening on the output side. And you don't even need to question what's happening on the input side in order to make that assessment on the output side. Um, and then finally, and perhaps most importantly, because I think this is the thing that's underlying all of this copyright conversation, is what this really means for people, and especially for creative workers, um, in terms of how this is going to be disruptive in our economy, and how we protect people's labor rights. And something that we've talked about a little bit at Public Knowledge so far is that um, what is, for example, going on in the organized labor movements, as we're seeing with the writer strike and the actors joining the strike as well, and their concerns about how AI is used in industries, that that is something that is an extremely valid target for criticism from workers and from civil society organizations and from policymakers in terms of holding companies to account in terms of how we want this technology to be used. It shouldn't be an inevitability that it's used uh, to its maximum extent. Um, it should be used primarily to enhance human creativity, to give us all more culture to enjoy, um, and to ensure that we have creative workers who are able to continue on um, in, in their fields and add more into that shared corpus that originally went into train so much of this. I don't think I can add much more beyond what was already said in terms of copyright law specifically, but I think one of the issues that should be addressed near term is how do we um, prevent this fear of massive risks such as copyright infringement from keeping smaller and medium-sized enterprises or even individual end users from using things like generative AI because they are not aware of the risks like copyright or, or able to identify them. So how can we create reasonable guardrails for uh, companies <clears throat> that don't have extensive legal teams or copyright experience and expertise to be able to um, sandbox with um, generative AI models internally, use them to improve their business processes and know that they have guardrails in place to pre prevent them from incurring that type of risk. I think we need a lot more work done in that space, um, providing tools and real actionable you know, codes of conduct even internally for companies to know that they can use generative AI and they can use it to improve their business and they are not going to be at risk of infringing on these laws and regulations that they will not know as well um, as policymakers who are well versed in this space. Yeah, and I'll just quickly uh, end with some things that I think policymakers should be thinking about uh, more with, with the scraping of data, which is more of what what I look at, I'm, I don't know much about copyright. Um, but I think it is a really interesting moment to start asking some questions about scraping and thinking about it more deeply from a couple of different perspectives. So first, uh, scraping data is a very popular way for researchers to get access to all kinds of information. So not just AI researchers, but also people who study the information environment, people who study the spread of conspiracies, uh, people who study climate change. I mean, there's so many researchers that depend on that data, and more and more companies are starting to use their terms of service and various legal means to try to block it. So that's just another thing to keep on your radar. And the other is privacy. So in the United States, we have a very long history of saying that public data is public data. There are no privacy concerns. Um, and even in our ethics framework, so the common rule which leads research ethics, even it says 
Public data is not human subjects data. Even if it was created on a Reddit forum about a very sensitive topic like mental health or uh, recovery from addiction, not human subjects. Uh, so it's time to maybe start looking at how sensitive some of this data is, and particularly children. So what we're seeing right now is a lot of young people turning 18 realizing that their very personal stories and pictures from when they were young were posted by their parents on blogs, on social media, et cetera. Doesn't belong to them, it wasn't their account. It was posted by parents um, and is being scraped up, put in repositories forever and ever. Um, so not really a copyright answer, but just a set of things I think to look at um, as we move forward on data protection. I, I have other questions. Uh, one, one, one thing I would note that the Congressional Research Service, uh, Laurie Harris and a few other researchers at CRS have done several um, papers on different aspects of artificial intelligence policy. I would recommend them to you if you have access to CRS. Um, they're really, really great. So um, always, I always want to give a shout out to Congressional Research Service. So um, any, any questions from the audience? And I'll just repeat them because we don't have the microphone. So just get up and identify yourself and just ask, ask the question. So um, the question is, good, uh, what in Congress is in a good, what, what bills or process is in a, going in a good direction, yeah. whether it passes or not? I would love to take a moment to give Congresswoman Yvette Clark a huge shout out. Um, she's just been a leader in this space for a long time. So if you haven't heard of the Deep Fakes Accountability Act, uh, it was introduced in the 116th, again in the 117th, and it literally mandates watermarks for generative AI tools. So she wrote that before any of you had ChatGPT on your computers. Okay, so there, there are people really out front on this. That bill is great. It, it was also part of the voluntary commitments. So for those of us complaining, wanting those voluntary commitments to have teeth, well, that's a good bill to take a look at. So she's also the leader behind the um, Algorithm Accountability Act, has been talking about bias in critical decisions for a long time. I, I think personally, Section 207 of ADPA had some very pretty, uh, Section 207 of um, ADPA had some pretty historic civil liberties protections um, that we were very excited about. And I, I think the algorithm design evaluation could be further fleshed out, but a lot there in terms of transparency reporting and, and what, um, what could be disclosed in terms of how you're using AI. Rep Clark's amendment. Um, so great question. I would be remiss if I didn't take a few minutes to talk about the Digital Platform Commission Act from uh, now Senator Michael Bennett and uh, Peter Welch. Um, so public knowledge has for a long time been an advocate of the idea of an expert digital regulator for online platforms, which is exactly what the Digital Platform Commission Act does. Um, this act in its current form would also capture a lot of online um, business models for artificial intelligence as well. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that, again, um, is, should have been a long time coming. We need an expert regulator on the field when it comes to technology policy for a couple of very big reasons. One is the flexibility. Um, and we've seen that as this technology has changed really fast, even over the last year, even with some of the bills that arguably do capture some of this stuff right now, they're gonna need updates to definitions because people who've been doing a lot of work on this were thinking about AI in a decision-making context for the most part. Um, and not necessarily in a generative context. I think we have to have uh, a little bit of humility about what the technology landscape might look like in five or 10 years from now when it comes to artificial intelligence or something else that we're not even imagining right now. So we need expert regulators that have the flexibility and the expertise to continue to adapt our laws and regulations um, with the same kind of speed that the technology is changing at. So that's gonna be really essential. And, and that doesn't denigrate at all the very important sector specific regulators that already exist. It's really important for the people who are already on the job with the expertise, like people at Department of Labor or EEOC or places like this, to continue to have the authority to go after AI in all of its forms. But that doesn't mean that we don't also want one expert coordinating digital regulator that could work through all of these problems and continue to change our laws and frameworks going forward.
So, so where would you draw the line with the FTC? Think, uh, would they think they're the regulator here? Where, where would you draw that line? Yeah, so the Federal Trade Commission has very specific areas where it works in terms of um, commercial uh, and antitrust authorities. So I think, as I was kind of saying earlier, we need to think even bigger than that, right? Privacy and competition policy are going to be components of this. Setting down affirmative regulations are going to be a component of this. Real accountability measures um, for how AI systems are designed and tested and deployed are going to be a component of this. And we've seen that amongst our regulatory agencies that there is the great capability for them to cooperate and overlap. Um, we saw this after the um, Office of Science and Technology Policy put out the blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights, and it was very shortly followed by a number of executive agencies getting together with joint memorandums of understanding and saying, we all are on board with these principles, we are going to continue to apply our authorities and coordinate together to try to make sure that this gets carried through the whole of government. Other questions? Please. A great question. Um, the question is, um, the question about open source, which I had on my list asked, so thank you for asking that. Um, open source, there's open source AI models, open source AI tools. Um, it's one thing to say, you know, have seven companies come to the White House and stand up and say, we're going to agree to these commitments, but what happens when they're, they're tools that are open source and we're, how do we deal with that? Yeah, that's a really great question. And it's definitely one of the challenges, and I think it goes um, right along with the uh, idea that there's a lot of work that's already been done, but that we're going to have to continue to think and with some humility about going forward and maybe changing our idea of what an expert regulator might look like in this area, that way they could adapt to things like open source. Because for example, some of the laws that existed in the last Congress, they really contemplate online services. And so when you have open source in the AI world where people are maybe going to be privately provisioning AI tools or deploying them at much smaller scale and then not rising to the level of one of these large online platforms that's contemplated, that means that we're going to need a different regulatory approach for dealing with artificial intelligence as it, if it continues to move in that direction. And, and there are really good reasons to want it to. Open source could be really, really valuable for ensuring that we have robust competition and choices for people. It helps a lot with transparency. Um, and open source is one of these things that would give people the ability to spread the value of AI more democratically um, and more equally throughout society rather than relying on large, concentrated private sector firms uh, to be the ones who are making the decisions about what this technology looks like for us. Yeah, I mean, I can say that uh, after some open source large language models were released, people played around with them and got them running on like my phone not talking to another computer, but literally running on a phone at a reasonable rate of speed. Not super fast, but fast enough to know that this will continue to work in the future and move faster and more efficiently. So I think open source is great. Uh, CCIA, also a huge supporter of open source historically. It definitely solves a lot of the competition and transparency concerns. At the same time, once something is open sourced, the idea that you're going to pull it off of the internet because it violates some provision of law is um, perhaps misguided. I mean, I'm just thinking back to DCSS, which broke DVD copyright encryption. And yes, that was probably illegal under the DMCA, but it's out there. There are shirts with it, and there's First Amendment concerns on source code and all that. This is all, you know, to some extent, this is all a battle we've fought before and a discussion we've had before. And we should be looking back at the lessons we learned the last time with open source and applying it as we think about how open source AI is going to be regulated and how it's going to impact things. Um, you know, if an open source model is developed in a country with a less uh, protective regime that doesn't mandate watermarking, is that going to block people in the US from using it? Should it? How is that going to be written into law? These are real questions that need to be answered, um, both so that companies can feel secure using open source models and this goes back to the sort of uh, the distinction I think Evie was making between the developer of a model and the implementer, the person using the model and applying it to a problem. Um, the open source models, the developers are going to be potentially hundreds of thousands of people, probably not that many, but it could be. 
the implementers are probably going to be the parties that bear the, the regulatory burden. So we do need to think about how whatever regulation is put in place is going to impact them and how they can be comfortable using an open source model without being so comfortable that they can ignore all of the regulation. I think we had one more question, um, and that'll probably be our last. Thank you. Um, I'm Kelsey Frierson, the Tech Congress fellow for this coming year. Um, my question is a little bit on the licensing regime or the proposed licensing regime. I've seen a couple of proposals calling for licenses for those different thresholds of AI, some calling for kind of like a self-compliance. So curious if you guys have thoughts on the pros and cons of either of those approaches. Uh, the question was on licensing regimes and self-attestation, et cetera. Um, I've been thinking about it a lot, and so my thoughts are very windy. Uh, happy to have a longer conversation with you, but I will just note that the Graham-Warren bill that dropped yesterday is the first I've seen text of a licensing style. which tends to be this pretty big definition, very much going after large for-profit sort of entities. So to the conversation about open source, that's definitely a flag when we're thinking about these definitions. Um, you know, we do sort of use this licensing approach at the FDA, right? So we do have a sense there, and I think it's really important to see what's worked with the FDA. Tools are being used in a bunch of different sectors. So what will that mean for a licensing? These interagency approaches, because that's definitely what it's going to take. But I still have a pretty big question mark. I'm curious what other people think. Yeah, I, I don't think I can add much more to what Anna said. I think it is one tool in the toolkit that does work well. Um, it does have limitations, right? Like any license, it's going to have to be guaranteed that that is what the AI model is being used for. And so you have to predicate end use basically before deploying the model. And I think that there's a risk that um, it can kind of act as a, a for other purposes, but it has somehow been licensed, so there's just that risk um, uh, of hiding more risks, basically. But I do think it's a useful tool. I just don't think it's a silver bullet. I think the same conversation can be had around watermarking, right? There, there's a lot of benefits to using this. It's a nascent technology, though, and uh, C2PA is the only standard for it, and it's quite nascent as well. I think it has to be implemented from the very beginning as soon as the generative AI model is produced. So, um, again, a, a, an this uh, stack of, of providers, developers, downstream users, what are the expectations of the end user? And I think there's also, back to the open source question, varying levels of transparency that can be delivered based on, on who needs to read that transparency report, like who is the audience, um, and you can determine then what, what should be included. Yeah. And not just range of tools, but range of harms. Yeah. What, what harms are we actually solving for? I think that's the most important question for all policymakers. Yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, uh, really quick, um, I think that it's helpful to think of it as certification um, is the language I'd love to use, both because it drives me crazy that in the copyright context we also talk about licensing, so it just gets super confusing when we're talking about licensed models, meaning models that are trained off of licensed material. Um, so if we could switch to certification language, it would just make my copyright nerd self much happier. Um, and certification is some of the language that's used in, in the Warren and uh, Graham bill right now, so that's great. Um, but uh, more seriously about it is that certification, especially as we can think of it in the context of like FDA or like consumer product safety, um, if we're thinking about it in that direction, might be a better way of thinking about it as addressing specific harms and things like that that we know that we want to avoid without getting into real anti-competition issues in terms of saying you need to have a license to be doing AI research, for example. Yeah, so I think this is where the risk management framework approach really comes in handy. There are going to be uses that are low risk, and certainly the cost of a, a certification or licensing regime is more than it's worth. There are going to be medium risk things, and here I'm thinking of like underwriters' laboratories. Whenever you plug something into the wall, if it's UL approved, that means it got tested for a reasonable amount of safety with being plugged into the wall. But they don't have to go out and do that ahead of time before they can start working on a product. That's something they do after the product is ready to go to market. For medium risk uh, issues, that might be the correct approach. And then I think about the FDA, and you know, certainly the drug approval process slows things down. There's a real cost to a pre-licensing approach or a, a pre-screening approach. But in certain use cases, like medicine, that's 
worthwhile. The, the benefits outweigh the costs. I don't want to have everybody just put their medicine out there. And even at the FDA, we've seen, um, not to name Theranos names, but <laughs> that was a, a case where we had something that was theoretically you know, FDA approved that was totally fraudulent. So, and that was in the medical device context, which is very differently regulated from drugs themselves. So we can look at these different approaches and we just have to calibrate the risk and the benefit of taking a, a pre-licensing, a pre-certification approach. Yeah, uh, former White House competition czar, uh, Tim Wu had um, an interesting post, a, had a strong view on this. Um, he posted about a month ago on licensing, um, the licensing model. But um, I, I think we're out of time. And we have, we've just forecasted like three other briefings that we have to do on a variety <laughs> of different topics going, uh, going forward. So hopefully they'll come back. Um, thank you for joining us for our first um, event back. And I want to thank my excellent panel for a great conversation. And um, we'll catch you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you.